This week, we have another astronomy talk um, by Frank Marchese, who's um, an assistant research astronomer at UC Berkeley, as well as a principal investigator here at the SETI Institute. Um, Frank received his PhD in planetary science from the University of Toulouse in France. And in general, his work involves the use of adaptive optics um, to make ground-based observations of asteroids, in particular binary asteroids. And he's also studied volcanism on Jupiter's moon Io. So I'll hand over the talk. First of all, it's always extremely intimidating to give a talk in your uh, host institute, so I'm kind of stressed today. I don't know why, but <laughs> I hope I'm I, I hope I'm gonna show you describe describe doing this talk uh, the work we have done the last on the past five years using various techniques to study multiple asteroid systems. Uh, this work is uh, funded by the Center for Adaptive Optics and uh, NASA and my host institution, SETI Institute, and UC Berkeley. So the outline of my talk, it's quite simple. First of all, I'm going to show you uh, how do we know that multiple asteroids exist and why they're useful to be studied. Um, I'm, going, I'm going to describe the mutual orbit of a few of them, some most interesting of them, such as a triple asteroid system and also uh, tr Trojan binary asteroid system. And then give you some um, information about additional techniques we have been using more recently to study uh, these binary asteroid systems, such as comparative spectroscopy, mutual event observation, stellar occultation, and then going to conclude. So the goal of this talk is to fill the wedding cake. I'm starting basically by a broad picture. What do we know about, adapt about um, multiple asteroid system? How many of them we have in the solar system? And then we go I'm, gonna, I'm going to narrow slowly the, the characteristic, get more information about the system, such as the orbit, the size of the primary, the size of the secondary, the spectroscopic type, et cetera, et cetera, until we reach the top of the pyramid of the wedding cake. I don't know yet what will be the top of the wedding cake, in fact. And this. Uh, all these characteristics are defined using dif various techniques, adaptive optics, like observation, radar, uh, angular imaging, etc., etc. So what do we know about asteroids? So asteroids are numerous. We know approximately 400,000 of them in the solar system. During my talk, I'm going to mention mostly main belt asteroids located between Mars and Jupiter. And this, this is a top view of the solar system and also Trojan asteroids, Jupiter Trojan asteroids, so the E of the solar system, which are uh, at the equilibrium point between Jupiter and the Sun, the L4 here and the L5 Trojan here. Um, I will mention as well some other population of small solar system bodies, such as near-Earth asteroids orbiting in, in, uh, in the inner part of the solar system, but also trans neptunian objects orbiting beyond the orbit of Neptune. So, Asteroids are extremely important because we think that they are the, the block, the remnant of the formation of the solar system. They are the block which form the terrestrial planet and form as well the core of the, of the giant planets. So when we study an asteroid, we see basically the past of the, our solar system. We have very few um, close-up images of uh, asteroids. Uh, I think seven of them has been visited by spacecraft, and this is a picture of four of them. And what you can see, they are diverse in size, in shape, in composition, and morphology on the surface. One of them, this one is the most interesting one, is the newest, newest asteroid visiting by the, by the spacecraft. Um, it's Itokawa, and the spacecraft was Ayabusa, Japanese mission. It's a very small tr uh, NEA, near Earth asteroid, 300 meter. And what you can see, the surface is completely different than the other asteroid we have here. There is no craters, for instance. If we, we think this is a rubble pie asteroid. So l looking at this asteroid, uh, looking at the composition, counting the crater, etc., we can have information of the s formation of our solar system. So one of the most uncertainty we have for, the form for, the so for this asteroid is what they're made of. We, this is a radar observation of um, uh, Tutatis, which is a NEA. Uh, which had a, a close flyby in 1998 with Earth and was observed with Arecibo. Using radar observation, we, we can get an accurate 
shape model of the asteroid. But we don't know the interior of the asteroid. We don't know if the asteroid is monolithic, if the asteroid is, is a contact binary, for instance, or it's a rubble pile. So we don't know the density, and we don't know the distribution of material in its, in its interior. And this is important because depending on the density, depen uh, depending on the composition, the distribution of material in its interior, an asteroid has a different co behavior. This is a, one of the extreme cases, a rubble pile asteroid. This is a, a pile of rubble. You blew up a house, a building, a bridge, and you get rubbers like this. You, count, you can count the rubbers, see the size distribution of the rubbers, get information about the, formation, about the impact or the, the energy needed to destroy this building, this asteroid. If you take this rubber and you put it in space, due to its self-gravity, it's going to form an asteroid, a rubber pie asteroid, like this. It may be covered with a layer of dust, so then you will not be able to see if they're using only visual observation, even with spacecraft, if this asteroid is monolithic or if this asteroid is, is really a rubble pie asteroid. And this is important because this simulation shows, for instance, the impact of two rubble pie asteroids, one kilometer size, made by my colleagues uh, Richardson, Derek Richardson. So this is two, uh, this is during the, uh, just before the impact, and this is during the impact. As you can see, this after the impact, we form a slightly larger asteroid, and we have very few fragments around it. Basically, the, the, after the impact, the two materials collide and accrete together, instead of disrupted in small pieces. We have seen, we think, rubble pile asteroid. This is one of the most famous one. It's uh, the first one, in fact. It's a close-up image of uh, Mathilde, observed with Nier. Mathilde is an interesting uh, main belt asteroid because he has a very irregular shape and he has very large craters. The, crater, the, the larger crater has the diameter of 33 kilometers for a body which has an average di diameter of 53 kilometers. To form a crater like this, you need to have, have a large impactor. Uh, we, we think that an asteroid will not have a, a monolithic asteroid will not have survived after a collision like that bec because it will be too energetic, it will be disrupted. So the only way you can keep this kind of asteroid uh, in one piece is like if only if you consider that this asteroid has a, has a large porosity. It's a, it, it, then f it therefore has a rubble pie uh, structure. These craters are not formed by excavation, they're formed by compaction. The impactor compacts the material, the energy is damped, keeping the structure of the asteroid. So this, after this observation, um, models have been developed, experiments have been done in laboratory, and this is the experiment, for instance, of the formation by compaction of, uh, of a crater uh, for a material of, with a porosity larger than 60%. And this is a typical crater, as you can see on the moon, which has, has, has formed sorry, by excavation and not by compaction. So let's go back to, to, the, to the binary asteroid program. So it has been thought for quite a while now that binary asteroid exists. The first scientific publication was published by Charles André in 1901. It's this paper here, that's a very short paper, like three pages, written in French because Charles André was French, and in this time it was possible to write <laughs> papers in French. So this is very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> this, was a very, this is a very nice paper to read, if you know the language, because in this time they were paying attention to the way they were writing. It was not only scientific, it was also poetry. It was ex it's extremely nicely written. <laughs> well, the result is wrong. Now, we know that, in fact, <laughs> it's always beautiful, but it's <laughs> uh, we know, in fact, that Eros, which uh, uh, Charles André observed by uh, light curve, is not a binary asteroid. But Charles André just mentioned that the light curve, the variation of light due to the spin of the, of, of the asteroid Eros, is very similar to the light curve of binary stars. So he mentioned that maybe this asteroid is in fact a double planet. That's the way he called it here, planet double. Um, we have other indication of the existence of binary asteroid. First, for instance, the observation of secondary stellar occultation. You can imagine that um, we knowing the orbit of asteroid, we can predict when this asteroid is going to occult a star. And this in the observation is very important because using this observation, we can derive the size and the shape of the asteroid. So some people have been making this kind of prediction, and some of them observe stellar occultation due to the large asteroid. Um, people uh, located nearby the main path of this occultation also reported 
a stellar occultation, a disappearance of the star, which lasts a few seconds. And this has been interpreted by the presence of a secondary moon nearby the primary, nearby the large asteroid. Then we have additional indications, such as unusual light curve. We're going to go back to that. Light curve with, for instance, multi-component, multi the spin of the primary and the spin of secondaries, moonlet, which are not uh, tidally locked. And also the presence of double impact craters on the surface, on the planetary surface, on the surface of, of uh, Venus, on the surface of the moon, but also on the surface of Europa. But we had to wait, in fact, 1993 to get the, f the first obvious detection of a binary asteroid, sy uh, asteroid system. We have here Dactyl, a moonlet uh, orbiting around Ida. Dactyl is a kilometer size, Ida is 40 kilometers in, in, in diameter, uh, in average. This observation was made possible when Galileo fly by this asteroid going toward Jupiter, Galileo spacecraft. So why we could not see why we cannot see binary asteroid we could not see binary asteroid from the ground because we don't have the resolution the angular resolution needed to see a, f a small companion orbiting a large large primary this is for instance a simulation of a binary asteroid observed with a seeing a quality of s s on the sky of 0.4 arc second and this is the re the same observation using what we call adaptive optics so adaptive optics is a technology which was developed in uh, uh, parallel in France and in, in, the U, in the U.S. The first adaptive optic system available to the community was Adonis on the, at a 3.6 meter telescope at Isola La Silla, and that's where I did my PhD. And then I came here in 2000, just at the beginning, just at the beginning of uh, uh, when the, when, sorry, w just when the Keck telescope got its first adaptive optic system. This was the first adaptive optic system on an 8, 10 meter class telescope. So what we do with adaptive optic system, but basically we correct in real time the effect of the atmospheric turbulence. If you observe a star with a, a very good sampling, this is what we, you will see. The star will not be a dot, it will be kind of a moving dot extended. And this is due to the fact that between us, uh, the telescope and the star, we have the atmosphere and the atmosphere have, have a, a random and uh, tur a random turbulence, because the atmosphere is not homogeneous, it's made of layers. So these layers distort the wave front, and what you see then is this kind of extended object, even if the star, you're losing the resolution, in fact. Uh, this is an, a, an observation with, with, without adaptive optics and with adaptive optics. Let's do that again. So when you, this without adaptive optics, and this is with adaptive optics, this is a real observation. When you close the loop, Basically, when you use the visible light to, I'm not going to go through the details of that, but basically you use the visible light of the target to analyze the wave fronts, and you use two mirrors, one tip tip mirror and one actuator mirrors to correct in real time the effect of the atmospheric turbulence, you get this kind of ob observation. But this one, but this one. This loop is done 400 times per second. So the limit of the adaptive optic system is basically you can observe only bright target magnitude less than 14 for the moment, uh, 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 until recently. And the sky coverage is very limited, only 5%. Additionally, as I say, we use the visible light to make the analysis, so we observe only in the near infrared. So now we have various adaptive optic systems on 8 10 meter class telescope. You have the Keck, the VLT at Isola Silla, and also the Gemini North Telescope. For the, for the so we, are, we use the visible pass for the correction, and we use the infrared, the infrared light for the science, science, science observation. If we observe with visible, the correction is not perfect. You see this kind of small aberration here? This is due to imperfection of the adaptive optic system. So if you observe in vis invisible, like we could split the light in half, for instance, put 50% of the visible light here and observe 50% of the visible in the science camera. But the correction in visible will, be, will not be as good as in infrared because the correction depends of the, of the lambda as well. So basically, even if you correct the, the phase with uh, a, an extremely good accuracy, like you correct the phase up to 120 nanometers, you will get a straight ratio, a quality on the, of, the, of the PSF 
in an infrared of 70%, but in visible, it will be only 10%. Right now, the Keck telescope provides a correction of up to 35%, 45%, sorry, in the near infrared, meaning that in visible, we have a correction of only 5%. So we have a very poor correction. I'm, gonna you, I'm, I'm going to show you that, in fact, we are working in getting rid of this limit and be able to now observe also invisible. This is a technological problem. Okay, so this is an illustration of what we, what we see from the telescope. This is from my colleague Imke de Pater at UC Berkeley. So this is uh, Uranus observed in K-band and in H-band uh, using the Keck telescope under seeing condition, very good seeing condition of 0.6 R second. And this is what you see when you close the loop of the AO system. Let's do that again. This is without, this is with. You can see clearly the difference. We see structure on the surface of, this, of, of the planet. You see companion satellites orbiting around the planet. And that's the main reason for which we are using adaptive optics, to see faint structures nearby bright objects. So we are doing the same using, uh, you had, we are using adaptive optics also to detect, to search and to study binary asteroid system. So this is a family portrait of basically bi non-binary, non-multiple asteroid system. The first, uh, the first one was then Dactyl observed uh, orbiting around Ida, discovered in 1993 using the Galileo spacecraft. We have to wait 1988 to get put the observation of the second binary asteroid system. It's Petit Prince here orbiting around Eugenia, which is somewhere here in, in this image here. Um, we observe now various, we know now more binary asteroid system. We, we know 165 of them, in fact, and 50% of them has been visualized, meaning we have, we have seen the, we, have see, we can see the companion using uh, high angular resolution images or radar observation. So the, re and the entire goal of this study is, in fact, to derive the mass of the of this asteroid and derive then the density to get constrained on the formation of the solar system. So in 2003, we initiated this large uh, campaign of observation. We basically requested telescope time on the VLT Keck Gemini. And uh, frankly, it's, not, it's very difficult to get time on this telescope. As you know, we have, there is a lot of competition. We get 55 hours on the VLT, two nights on the Keck, and uh, half a night on the Gemini North. But some of these telescopes, have also archives, so we went through the archive and we extract all observation of, of asteroids. Or we also did the same for, the H, for HST, CFHT, and a few observations were taken with using the Leak 3 meter telescope. So in total, we have 1,100 observations of uh, approximately 360 uh, small solar system bodies. This is the kind of observation we have. As you see, it's not as impressive as, uh, as a spacecraft observation. You have here, the primary is somewhere here. I'm showing you, you here the low level of intensity. So you can see the secondary here. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to describe the 165 binary asteroid system because I think it's going to be a little bit too boring. Uh, the goal is to show you the techniques and what you can do with the techniques. So I'm going to focus only on a few of them. One of the most interesting one was, is 87 Sylvia. 87 Sylvia is a, is a main belt asteroid, large main belt asteroid, orbiting in what we call the sea belt uh, population, which is the outer part of the, of the main belt. Sylvia is known to have a companion since 2001. He was, he was discovered by uh, Jean-Luc Margot using the Keck telescope. That's the small dot you have here, and this is the primary. So we requ requested time with the VLT, to follow, up this, to follow up this system to extract the orbit of, this, of, this, of the moon. And during this observation, in fact, this observation was taken using uh, uh, Q-scheduling. So basically, they take all the data for us and then send it to us uh, six months later when, they have been, when the program has been completed. So when I look at the first image, I saw this companion, but I also saw this secondary blob here, smaller, closer to the primary. So my first idea was that this should be an artifact. But then I look at the second image and I saw the, second, the artifact again. And then I suddenly realized that in fact we were observing here a brother for this companion, as another moon orbiting around 87 Sylvia. This was possible with the VLT because the quality of the adaptive optic system, of the VLT adaptive optic system was better in, than the Keck adaptive optic system in this time. 
And this is a composite image showing all the detection of the, of the innermost moon and the outermost moon. This is, so this is a various observation putting, uh, put together. As you can see, we can also resolve the primary. So without entering into detail, we fit the orbit of the, uh, using this point here, we just simply fit the orbit of, uh, of the innermost and the outermost moon. We found out that the, the, the orbits are coplanar, prograde, and equatorial, meaning that this, the moons are orbiting in the equatorial plane of the primary. We also detect precession, like acceleration of, this, of the innermost moonlet due to the, to the uh, obliteness of, of the primary. Very recently, meaning yesterday, we, uh, <laughs> we published uh, a paper showing that, in fact, the stability, the system is stable due to the obliteness of the primary. Without an uh, irregular shape of the primary, the system will not be stable. After a while, this, the, the, the orbit will we acquire a high eccentricity and will collide with the primary. So this was the first discovery of a triple asteroid system. It was done in, yes? Jupiter has to be involved. And since this is really new, I don't want to go through that yet because I really need to carefully read the paper. <laughs> but I have the copy if you want. <laughs> um, so yeah, we discovered new triple asteroid system in 2006, 45, Eugenia, 2007, 3749, Balam. And like in September, we discovered that uh, 216 Cleopatra is also a triple asteroid system. So. This is now rocket science, but using the orbit, we derive, and the Fer Kepler law, we derive the mass. We know the sh shape and size of the primary. Sometimes we resolve it. This is the case here. Sometimes we use thermal observation. Sometimes we use light curve plus thermal observation plus stellar occultation to have the, 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 the size of the primary. And we derive the density. So in the case of uh, 87 Sylvia, we have a very low bulk density of 1.2 1 gram cc. I say very low because 87 Sylvia, it's a C-type asteroid. So it's supposed to, be a, to have a carbonaceous chondrite meteorite analog. So we have a density, this is sample we can collect from on the ground, which has, some, which has a density between 2 and 3 grams cc. So the only way we can reconciliate this low bulk density with the density of meteorite analog is implying that we have a high porosity in the interior of this, of this, uh, of this asteroid. So we have a rubble pie internal structure for the primary with a density be porosity between 25 and 60 percent. We have a circular program equatorial orbit for the moonlet. So what will be the origin of the system? Well, I didn't know that until um, I read papers by um, Patrick Michel. Patrick Michel published in 2001, so before the discovery of 87 Sylvia, a bunch of uh, simulation that I don't really know the d well the details, but it's basically a uh, description of a, a catastrophic description of a, of a parent asteroid. And they, they run the, the end body code to see what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, system will be formed uh, after the collision. So this is an example. This is a collision of, uh, of a 100 kilometer radius uh, ast asteroid. Um, it's been impacted by a, a, a few kilometer size uh, impactor. And that there is entire description of the entire system, accretion of the large fragment first. Then there is a swarm of fragments. If you let run this simulation, I never do that, in fact, but uh, you need to trust Patrick in this case. Uh, if you let run this simulation for a while, you will see that the swarm of fragments tend to disappear. And this, you can see here, it's a moonlet which will remain. We will form very close to the primary and, and have a kilometer size. They mentioned in their paper, very short paper published in Nature, that the, in the 5% of the simulation, they've seen multiple systems, multiple moons orbiting around. I think this is the most, most likely scenario for form this kind of uh, system, such as 87 Sylvia, because we have a, we have a, a rubble pie primary with a regular shape and this very small moonlets, kilometer size, orbiting very close to the primary. <coughs> Okay, so the cool part of my, of my job is that when we discover a moonlet and when you set the orbit of the moonlet, you can give the name to, to the moonlet. So I could call it SETI Institute, or, but I decided that we're going to call them uh, 
uh, Romulus and Romus because uh, Sylvia is the mother of uh, Romulus and Romus, the founder of Rome. And it's very good to have always the kids close to their mother. <laughs> so um, this name was officially accepted uh, by the International Astronomical Union. So I mentioned that we, have, we discovered a new triple asteroid system and just a brief highlight. This is uh, 216 Cleopatra. It's an M-type asteroid. We observed using the KKO system very recently in September 2008. This is a long story of my thesis. I observed this one in May 1999 with Adonis, a 3.6-meter telescope. And I, you based on this image, we mentioned that, oh, he has this, the primary has this kind of bilobated shape. So we developed this kind of models. At the same time, uh, Steve, Steve Ostro was observing Cleopatra and published uh, in, in science that um, this asteroid has this kind of dog bone shape. So we have a long debate whether or not it was a dog bone shape of uh, this kind of equilibrium shape. I'd have to wait September 2008 to be able to observe it again using the KKO system, so nine years later. And this is the observation we have. And the, the, the none of the models, in fact, fit, fit perfectly the observation, the AO observation. It's neither a dog bone shape, neither the uh, Roche ellipsoid, sh ellipsoid shape. The point is that using the KKO system, because we have m much better quality than with the, f with the four meter telescope in 1999, we've been able also to observe two moonlets here, orbiting around the, around the same type. And this is interesting because we predicted that, in fact. Because based on the shape of the primary, we assume that he was, he has a, uh, this, this primary has, was loosely bound. And most likely, because it's, it's, a, it's a fast rest rotator, we should see fragment of the primary orbiting around it. And that's what we discover. Um, using the orbit, which is very preliminary, we get a density, which this time is much higher than the density of a C-type, a density between 2.5 and 3 grams cc. This is what we expect, because M-type asteroids are supposedly, dominate, uh, are supposedly a composition dominated in iron and nickel. So this is a preliminary, uh, of course, uh, result. OK, so can we look for binary asteroids in other population? As I say, only 5% of the sky can be observed using adaptive optic system, which, because we are limited to a magnitude of 13.5 invisible. This, that means that we can observe only 400 man belt and no Trojan, no NEAs, no TNOs. So how can, we op uh, how can we observe this fainter and further object? Well, there is different pos possibility, and one of them is basically to create a star in the sky to, be, to use it as a reference. And that's what we do with laser guy star. So this is, an observe this is a, uh, an, a real picture taken by uh, Lori Hatch. What I was observing this time, I was looking, f searching for binary Trojan asteroid, and she was in a dome at Mauna Kea taking picture. So what we, what we do in this case, we use a thin layer of sodium at in the mesosphere, 100 kilometer altitude. We excite this thin layer of sodium using a la laser uh, with uh, a dye laser with the same frequency, and we create a faint star that you can see here, main, of magnitude between 10 to 12, approximately. And we use this star for our adaptive optic system to correct the atmospheric turbulences. So that means that now we can almost get a full, complete coverage of the sky using this kind of technology. And since we have an aperture larger than an HST, we have even better resolution than Hubble Space Telescopes. So we've been using this adaptive optic system with a guy star in 2004, 2005 to follow up the orbit of uh, Patroclus. 617 Patroclus is known to be a binary asteroid system since 2001. It was discovered by Bill Merlin under excellent seeing condition using the Gemini uh, telescope. But the orbit was unknown. So we basically used the first, the commissioning of the Keck LGSAO system to do a follow-up observation. This is observation, three observations taken with the Keck. This is one observation taken with the Gemini. So once again, we have various observations. We fit the orbit. We, we have the, the size estimated by thermal, uh, thermal observation. We derive a density of 0.8. Quite, quite interesting. We have an asteroid which is further away from the, s from the sun. It's a, it's a Trojan asteroid. It has a very low de bell density. Densi bell density, which implies that he has a, a significant, um, significant portion of ice in his interior. 
So we published this, pa this paper in, in uh, Nature uh, in 2006, mentioning that, oh, maybe Trojan asteroids are in fact planetesimal, which has been captured during migration of the planet. I'm going to go back to that later. This is always the case. You have a nice scenario, you have a nice story, a nice fairy tale, and then you do one more observation, and you discover that we discovered that 624 Hector is another Trojan asteroid, has this kind of bilobated shape, but he also has a moon. We fit the orbit of the moon, and in this case, we get a density of 2.1. So a density significantly higher than the density of Patroclus. These two asteroids are both Trojan asteroids. So how we can, can we reconcile these differences in density for two bodies, which are supposedly the same origin? Well, they may have a different evolution. So as I said, I don't have an answer yet, but I have a nice fairy tale. So 617 Patroclus is maybe a capture IC uh, planetesimal. During the migration of the planet, uh, when Saturn crossed the, the one, two mean motion resonance of uh, Jupiter, we have this kind of disruption. This is the Nice model that some of you may have heard about, which explains everything. So <laughs> we have this kind of disruption of, uh, of a disk of planetesimal orbiting further away. And this, this disk of planetesim, uh, some of this planetesimal was sun in the inner part of the solar system, being captured in the Lagrange point of uh, Jupiter, or um, been, uh, or been sun uh, pro produce also the late heavy bombardment. So when you discuss with the people who are doing this kind of simulation, uh, Morbidelli, for instance, he mentioned to us that before being captured, this Trojan asteroid, this icy planetesimal, have close encounter with Jupiter. So maybe this 617 Patroclus, which is a double, ban double system, is in fact an icy planetesimal with split after a close encounter with Jupiter, before, before being captured. This happened 3.7 3, uh, 3 billion years ago. It's a very primitive body then. And 624 Hector is, has a higher density. He has this elongated shape. He has a moon. So most likely, this body formed by collision like this kind of description. And the reason for which we have a higher density for 624 Hector is because the icy material has been volatili vola volatilized <laughs> after the catastrophic disruption and form only, uh, and the density is higher in the case of Hector because the, f the material which reformed the, the new Hector has a higher density. OK, as you can see, this is a nice fairy tale. I'm not very certain about that. We will definitely need to work on this kind of scenario. And what we really need to do now is to discover more of this binary Trojan asteroid. OK, so another technique is, for instance, as you, I mentioned, we we're trying to know how this system form. Well, there is other possibilities, for instance, to do spectroscopic comparison of a binary asteroid. This is 22 Calliope here. Uh, which, which, is known to have a, which is known to have a moon called Linus since 2001. Um, what we think is that if the moon is a, uh, well, has the same origin than the, than the primary, formed by catastrophic disruption or fission, it should have then the same composition. So what we did, we, we used the KKO system with this new kind of instrument called uh, integral field unit to do spectroscopy in the same time than images. And we get spectra taken in z, uh, at 1 micron, 1.2 micron, uh, 1.6 and 2.2 micron with a very good resolution. This is the first successful, successful observation, comparison of the, the spectra of a primary and its moonlet. And this is the result. And this also is very new. It's been submitted a week ago. So let's uh, not go through too much details here. But basically, what this spectra, this ratio of spectra show is that the moon and the primary have the same infrared spectra. So most likely the same composition and most likely the same age. Because the, the spectra in the near infrared is affected by the age by the, by the, due to the space weathering. So this will imply that, in fact, the moon and the primary form by, the, by a catastrophic disruption. OK, so I'm just, I show you results with adaptive optics. With adaptive optics, we can derive the orbit of uh, the mutual orbit of a binary asteroid system, but we still limit. We still have a limited resolution of 40 to 50 milli arc second. 
Uh, with adaptive optics, we can derive the size of the primary, but a few of them are resolved. And even when we derive the, the size, we have an uncertainty of 5 to 10 percent, which imply an uncertainty of up to 30 percent in a bulk density. With adap adaptive optics, we have uh, we can have an estimate of the size of the satellites if you assume that the satellite and the primary have the same albedo. So we still have a, s a significant uncertainty on, this on the size of the satellite. So that's the reason we're using that new techniques to study this binary asteroid system. Adaptive optics doesn't solve everything. It's not like, it's not like the, s the NIST model. So <laughs> we have been using, over the last two years, a constellation of um, collaborators and, and the telescope to observe binary asteroid system. So I'm not going to go through all of them. This is a telescope. This is a basically a network. And we observe s uh, almost regularly a large number of asteroid systems uh, with signif a significant contribution of amateur astronomers. I'm going to show you what we did recently. So in 2005, we published a paper showing that a list of occultation, of stellar occultation, implying binary uh, asteroid system. Uh, using 35 observations with, uh, with adaptive optics, we derived the mutual orbit of Linus, satellite of Calliope. So we have been able to predict where will be the moon, Linus, during one of the stellar occultations which happened in November 2006 over Japan. This is the path of the primary, which is extended because the primary is large, it's 100 kilometers in diameter, and this is the predicted <coughs> path of the secondary. It was, we are very lucky because this occultation happened in Japan, and amateur astronomers in Japan are extremely well equipped. They have a lot of uh, uh, telescope, but also CCD camera, and they're extremely motivated. And in fact, they detected the stellar occultation. They detected the stellar occultation of the primary, which lasts 23 seconds, and some of them, seven of them, detected the stellar occultation of the secondary, which lasts four seconds. This is the analysis of the data. So basically, just to, to show you, this is the position we predicted. Only one Japanese astronomer listened to us and went to the pred predicted position. <laughs> <laughs> and seven of them were here. This, there wa this was a group, of, in fact, of amateur astronomers. And they used to observe always in this area because it was, it was far away from a, a large city. And they observed the disappearance, the blinking of the star, which lasts a few seconds, Due to, the, due to the occultation by the, by the moon of, of Calliope. And this is basically the chord, and this is the size estimate we have. This is the first time we can derive with this technique the size of the moon of binary asteroid. This, this one is pretty large, it's 30 kilometers in diameter. And they also observe the, 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 the occultation due to the, pri the primary. And we also derive a, a good estimate of the size of the primary. So this experiment has been done for another binary asteroid, which is 90 Antiope. I'm not going to go through that. We're still working on publishing this uh, result. OK, another technique is to use mutual events. So in this case, we once again, we know the orbit of Linus, companion of Calliope. And we predicted that the system will be in equinox in, 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 um, in the spring 2007, North Hemisphere spring. So basically what you will see, you have the spin of the primary, which produces this large variation of light. But on the top of that, you can have sometimes the moon sh casts its shadow on the top of the primary, so you have a small attenuation, or sometimes the moon go behind in the shadow of the primary, and you also have another attenuation, which lasts less than four hours, and has a very, uh, uh, and uh, produce a depth, a variation of 0 0.08 magnitude. So we made prediction, and we motivated a large group of uh, observers, and in fact, six detection has been made, of six detection of occultation, of mutual events has been made using uh, this uh, prediction, uh, cons in with, um, which constitute only three events. So this is the kind of uh, occultation we have. So you need to imagine that on the top of that, we have a large variation of uh, 0.7 magnitude. And what we do, we subtract this large variation due to the spin of the primary to see the attenuation due to the fact that the moon is entering in the shadow of the primary. And we get a small, uh, a small uh, decrease of brightness of 0.08 magnitude. 
using this kind of, um, of uh, measurement, we derive, I'm not going to go through all the details, but we derive the size of the moon and the size of the primary. And the key part here is that Calliope, it's an M-type asteroid once again. And we have, a very, we, ha we have some trouble because the previous uh, measurement, size measurement by ARAS implied that the density was 1.7 gram cc, which was completely not what we expected for M-type asteroid. Using this new measurement, combined with the stellar occultation I showed you previously, we derive a density of 3.3 gram cc, which is what we expect for an M-type aste for an asteroid, which is a rubble pipe but with a metallic composition. Okay, so other kind of techniques we've been using, but I'm not going to go through the details because it's extremely. Uh, uh, I will. It will take me half hour to explain all of that. But we basically use. Uh, this network of telescopes to monitor the, the light curve of uh, binary asteroid, and sometimes we see multi-component events. So this is, for instance, an observation that is like uh, eight or ten different telescopes here. We put together the variation of light due to the spin of the primary, and we also see some decrease, larger decrease, which are in fact occultation of occultation or um, eclipse event due to the moon. So this. Peter Pravets working from Andreyev Observatory in Czech Republic has been working with us uh, on this specific target, which is 3749 Balam. And we have the spin of the primary, which is a long uh, spin uh, in something like six hours, if I remember. And then we have attenuation due to the, to the secondary. And in fact, we announced recently that using this kind of technique, we can also detect triple asteroid system. 3749 Balam is in fact a triple asteroid system. We knew it was a binary, it was this, that we have this satellite which was discovered using adaptive optic system, far away at 300 kilometers. But using this kind of mutual event observation, like of observation, we, we found out that in fact the central body is composed of two components. We have absolutely no idea how to form this kind of binary aster a triple asteroid system. So if any of you wants to <coughs> Uh, want to think about it and play and use their models, that would be extremely useful because this is very like, it's not something we were expecting. So what we do now is also you use Spitzer telescope and uh, infrared uh, spectrograph to observe binary asteroid system. Uh, 10 minutes to go through that. So remember 617 Patroclus. We have, it's a Trojan asteroid system. We have same size binary system, the Patroclus here, may not use here. Uh, remember that I, we derive a density of 0.8 gram cc, there's an error bar of 0.2 in this case, which implies that we have a significant composition, uh, significant uh, composition of, uh, significant IC composition for this Trojan asteroid. So the, the size was made using a diameter published by uh, Fernandez et al. in 2003 using the Keck telescope and the thermal <laughs> camera. So we decided to observe this system again using Spitzer and IRS. One of our goal was to measure, in fact, the thermal inertia. For this, uh, you all know what the thermal inertia is. It's basically the way the surface or the material react to a change of temperature. The typical thermal inertia we have for the lunar regolith is 50, and the for rock is 2,000, approximately. We have very few thermal inertia for main belt asteroid and for NEAs, and they have a large scale of variation. So one of the questions we had is, what will be the thermal inertia of a Trojan asteroid? Well, when you know that you have a binary Trojan asteroid, it's easier to measure this kind of thermal inertia, because what we could use is mutual events to, uh, to we could use is mutual events. So this is, for instance, Pat uh, Patroclus and Minotius. After, after determining the orbit using adaptive optic system, we predicted that you, the system will be seen once again in equinox in 2007. And in this case, where you can see the, sh the, the system will, will enter in eclipse and also in occultation. So we requested time with Spitzer telescope a year in advance to observe this kind of event. So we predicted when this event will happen and we get uh, nine or 10 hours with Spitzer telescope. There. It's interesting because they give us the time, they say it's very unlikely this is going to work because basically the uncertainty on our model was still important. But in fact, we success successfully detected mutual event observation using Spitzer Telescope. 
Um, so this is the observation. This is the, um, uh, the graph is not very, uh, very good quality, but basically the drop of intensity in, in the near infrared observed at 20 micron due to the eclipse of event one here and event two here. Well, you can see the here it's a spectra, in fact. It's a variation, the, sp the spectra before and during uh, an eclipse event. So using this spectra, we can also derive the thermal inertia because the surface of the, of the component cooled down. So you can, and do after doing the, when the shadow of the, the larger cast on the, sh on the secondary, so we can derive the, 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 the thermal inertia as well as the size of the, of the, of the component. So we get this uh, work almost published. Uh, in fact, it's still in, uh, it's still in the review. But we get a very low thermal inertia, a thermal inertia less than 10 MKS. This is the first reliable observation, uh, reliable uh, measurement of the thermal inertia of a Trojan asteroid. And it's very low compared to the thermal inertia of uh, rock, but also very low compared to the thermal inertia of uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So we think that this kind of asteroid is very primitive. We have on the surface a thin, a thick layer of uh, regolith, and that's why we have uh, such a low thermal inertia. This is this confirms basically the idea that Trojan asteroids, such as Patroclus and Menotius, formed 3.5 billion years ago and are extremely primitive. Uh, another program we ran recently with the Spitzer IRS is the observation of, um, of binary asteroids uh, outside of mutual event configuration to estimate their size, albedo, and thermal inertia, of course, and surface composition. This is a work I'm doing in collaboration with Josh Emery and others. Um, since I don't have much time, I'm just going to give you here the highlight of this, of this uh, work. Using the mutual orbit, we have the mass. Using Spitzer observation, we have the size. So we can start now seeing uh, uh, the density. Uh, can now measure accurately the density. Interestingly, for all M-type asteroids, we have a density, all binary M-type asteroids, we have a density of 3.3 gram cc. For all C-group binary asteroids, we have a density quite low of 1 gram cc. And for most of the S-type we have so far, we have a density of 2.2 gram cc. So this is the first time we can confirm that there is a direct relation between the taxonomic classes de determined by visible spectroscopy and the, um, the interior of the, of the asteroid. But also, interestingly, it's interesting to, sh to see that for all these binary asteroid systems, for most of them, because I don't have time to go through all of them, we have a bulk density which is always lower than the meteorite analog analogs, implying that we, we always have a significant macroporosity up between 30 and 50 percent. So most likely, this macroporosity is related to the way they form, or the way they, or the reason for which they are binary asteroid systems. And we go back to the wedding cake. <laughs> okay, so after five minutes to do to, to summarize all of this in this wedding cake. So the first step was to show that multiple asteroid systems exist. Yes, they exist. We know 165 of them right now. They exist in all populations of the solar system. Uh, we start n we using the, our observation and other observations by Peter Pravex, by Bill Merlin, etc. We even start having some multiplicity rates in each population. We see that for any years, the multiplicity rate is between 10 to 15 percent. For large main belt asteroids, the multiplicity rate is 6 percent. For small, I don't have that here, but I should have put it. For small MB, uh, main belt asteroid, the multiplicity rate can be between 10 to 10 to 20 percent. The multiplicity rate for Trojan asteroid is lower, 4 percent. But in this case, we know that we are limited by the sensitivity of our instrument still. And additionally, we know now more. We know that multiple asteroid system. We know uh, four triple main belt asteroid one triple NEA, and one triple uh, transneptunian. Well, I should say two triple transneptunian here because Pluto, Charon, is also a transneptunian object. So on these 165 of them, we have the orbit of only uh, 40%. And that's the goal of 
the goal of my my work is in fact to fill this 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 uh, wedding cake. So we only have 40% of the mutual orbit, meaning that we have the mass of only 40% of them. We have the size and shape of the of the primary for very few of them. Uh, they were dis estimated by um, thermal observation, that's what I did for IRS, by stellar occultation, by radar, or sometimes by adaptive optics when they can be resolved. Knowing the size and shape and the mutual orbit, we get the bulk density, which gives us information on the formation of this binary asteroid system. Finally, we, uh, also we have the size and shape estimate for very few uh, companion. They have been estimated by um, uh, stellar occultation, but also by adaptive optics observation. We are working with Josh Emery on a program to do integrated spectroscopy, so I mean, meaning that have the taxonomic class for all of them. For the moment, we have the taxonomic class of only a quarter of this binary asteroid system, and for very few of them, we have a near infrared spectra. Um, we're refining this pyramid going through the comparative spectroscopy. Uh, this is like, I'll show you one example. We did compara comparative spectroscopy for only one binary asteroid, Calliope and Linus. And we show that Calliope and Linus have the same spectra, implying that they have the same, uh, they, are f they were formed together from the same material in the same time. So most likely a catastrophic disruption. Uh, finally, we are still working on, the, uh, on determining the bulk density and the porosity of, this, of the, this asteroid. And as I say, we have the bulk density of only 20% of them. The new thing we could do with using mid-infrared telescopes, such as Spitzer, um, but also ground-based telescope, is to estimate the thermal inertia of the surface. All this at work, the ultimate goal will be, of course, to have the perfect target or the perfect targets, if you have a, a multiple rendezvous mission, for a space mission. How, is, how will it be to visit a, sp a, a space, uh, how it will be to visit a multiple asteroid system using a spacecraft? So I, I show you various of techniques, but of course I'm gonna continue to observe, to fill this pyramid using new techniques, new instruments. Uh, we are working at CAC on the next generation adaptive optic system, which will be available in 2013, and will allow to, obs to get observation invisible, spectroscopy invisible as well. Um, of course, we have the, f the, the new, the giant segmenting telescopes, such as the TMT, the European ELT, or the giant Mag Magellan, which will be available in 2017. Uh, using SOFIA, we could use the infrared, mid-infrared capability to get size estimate of more of this binary asteroid, but also use the fact that this station is mobile to observe more of these occultations. And finally, this survey, such as PENSTAR LSST, will provide a lot of light curve of binary asteroid system. A lot of light curve, so meaning that we will be able to have a better estimate of the multiplicity rate for this uh, binary asteroid per population. Uh, no, this is, uh, I think it's, a, it's, they say two, or two or three in the, in the web page, but uh, I'm not 100% sure about this. Someone has an idea about the... Well, they're planning to build one. Oh, yeah? I don't know what their dreams might be. <laughs> 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 but anyway, this is projects, so it's not funded yet, apparently. So it's not funded yet, apparently. And this is like an idea of what, we'll, yeah. what it will be to have, a to have a space mission around a binary asteroid. Some of you have seen maybe this. This, was, this work was made possible thanks to S4P. Uh, we hosted at NASA M's uh, 12, 11 students, and they work on the, on the concept of a space mission uh, around the, uh, Didymos uh, binary NEA asteroids. And I would like to thank all my collaborators from various institutions. Thank you. Talk, Frank. Let me uh, use my prerogative to ask the first question. How does the um, how does the thermal inertial of the um, lunar regolith compare to that of the asteroid that you discussed? Uh, lunar regoliths have a thermal inertia which is uh, I have it here. Sorry. Let me see. That. Fifty. So okay. we have a, a thermal inertia which is lower than that.
So for those of us, of us who aren't asteroid experts, can you just say what an M and an S and a C class asteroid is? Okay. An M and an S and a C class, what are the classes? Okay, so, yeah, sorry. C-type asteroids are characterized by a visible spectra which, is, which doesn't have any absorption features and uh, slightly red, and the near infrared spectra will be the same. <laughs> so we assume that the meteorite analog will be a carbonaceous chondrite. S-type asteroids are characterized by a, s a strong absorption burn at 0 0.9, 0 0.9 and 2.1 micron, implying that they have the same composition, they have, a s they have mafic material, so rocky mat material. And the uh, M-type asteroid are in fact um, the same than C-type, but they have a higher albedo, 0.14 uh, invisible. C-type asteroids have an albedo of 0.04. <laughs> so maybe we should ask him the question then. <laughs> so my summary was good or did I? <laughs> Thank you. decay in the orbit what uh, what does that imply is that that you're talking about tidal forces then um, I did not mention no the reason for which the inner moon um, okay the, I mentioned that 87 Sylvia we, we did some study of 87 Sylvia which showed that basically the system is stable only if the primary has a significant obliness yeah. okay if we don't have this obliness what happened the, the um, because of the perturbation of, by Jupiter, the, basically the moons get eccentricity, and they're also in resonance. I didn't mention that, but they're in resonance. So one bring, uh, bring the other one in, in with a higher eccentricity, and they finally eat, will end up eating the, the, surf, the, the primary. So the lifetime is, I need to go back to the paper, but it's less than a million, year, a million years old. Well, I guess then, uh, have you observed any changes in the orbit due to uh, tidal effects? We observe precessions effect, which are the dominance, but we never observe anything due to the tides yet. But we, start, we started observing them like only three, four years ago, and uh, the tides will have uh, it's a long-term effect, of course. Um, are there any s are there any serious plans for for missions to asteroids? And do, do, do you happen to know the status of the Don Quixote mission from ESA? To go to a binary asteroid or to any asteroid? That's right, yeah. uh, yes, there is, there is a lot of con different concepts. Uh, funded serious Ah, missions. Funded we have done, which is gonna <laughs> going to, uh, to uh, reach, uh, I think it's Vesta first in four years or three years. Um, ESA is working on a Don Quixote project, but it's not, it's in phase A still. Uh, uh, what do I have on my mind? I, I have a list of all the missions, I could go through that, but uh, I have one question here. Um, most of your modeling suggests that uh, the companions are as a result of uh, collisions. Uh, are there any models suggesting a uh, capture? Yes, in the trans neptunian population. Sorry? The trans neptunian population, oh, okay. there is suggestion that this, most of the binary, uh, w extremely well separated binary asteroid, uh, binary trans neptunian object are in fact formed by capture. And they were formed by captures um, when the planetis when the number of planetesimal when the density of planetesimal was more important, so at the beginning of the just at the formation of the solar system. Is there a difference in composition between uh, asteroids which are um, closer into the sun versus the ones that are further out? Uh, that been never been figu figured out. We are trying to figure out that now, but it's not. Let's, it's a very difficult, debatable question. Thank you.